Hello, everybody. A very good evening to all who are joining from India. And if you're joining from somewhere outside of India, good morning or good afternoon. I am Vidisha Bhattacharya, Growth Manager of Stack.me. Welcome to the second season of the Stack.me Academy Masterclass on creating diverse content around your niche area of interest. Stack.me Academy is our initiative to ensure those who are on the platform and also creators around the world as well get to be better at things they are focusing on. For instance, writing, audio, podcasts, business writing, fiction, photography, illustrations, a lot of different topics that we are going to run our masterclasses on. So if you haven't checked out our earlier masterclasses, please do visit our YouTube channel or Facebook page where you will find them all. With that, I'm really excited to present our masterclass today with Menaka Raman on creating diverse content around your niche area of interest. Menaka is a children's book author and communications consultant. She is the author of 13 picture books for children, including Gappu Khan Dance, Topi Rockets from Tumba, and Ida Investigates the Invisible. Her book, Loki Takes Guard, won the Valley of Words Award for writing for young adults. Her short stories have appeared in anthologies published by Penguin, Speaking Tiger, and Scholastic India. She has written about parenting and uh, children's books for the Hindu, New Indian Express, Vogue, and other publications. Everything is about content these days and keeping the content machine running. In this masterclass, she will address questions such as, is it possible to keep your content engine running in perpetuity though? Should you stick to one format or way of presenting your content or should you mix things up? Where do you look for ideas? What are the different ways you can talk about your area of interest? So without further ado, I will hand the floor off to Menaka. And at the end of the session, we will have Q&A. So wherever you are following this masterclass, please drop in your questions in the comment section. We've always tried our best in answering most questions in our previous sessions. So we promise to make that happen today as well. With that, Menaka, over to you. Thank you so much, Pidisha. Thanks for that lovely introduction. And um, thank you, everyone who is uh, joining this masterclass today. Though I have to say, masterclass sounds really daunting. So I'm just going to call it a session. So I feel a little less nervous about doing this whole thing. But yeah, thank you so much for joining in. Like Pidisha said, we're going to be talking about ways in which you can create uh, diverse, engaging content and build a community of readers around, you know, an area of interest that you're passionate about, that you're interested in, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so if we can have the deck go up, thank you so much. All right. Uh, so like Padisha said, I do many things. I'm a communications consultant and I work with the nonprofit, social sector enterprises, sometimes are small to medium range, uh, sized companies, uh, basically helping them come up with communication strategies uh, and also coming up with social media strategies and helping them roll those plans out, branding, visual look and design, tone, you know, brand tone, so on and so forth. I currently work with a podcast production company called Vaka Media. Um, and you can see the album artwork for one of our shows up there. It's called City of Women. I have also been a freelance writer, for about 15, 16 years now, I started out doing some freelance writing on culture and art and, you know, things like that. And then I once I became a parent, I began writing more about parenting. So that's another thing I do. I currently write um, quite frequently about children's books for Hindu and for the Hindu Sunday magazine. And of course, the third thing that I love to do is uh, write books for children. In all of these things, though, if there is a common thread that ties together me being a consultant, a columnist, and an author. It's that as I'm always looking for ideas and for new ideas. And whether those ideas kind of translate into content, quote unquote, uh, or a column, or you know, an idea for a new manuscript, I don't think it really matters. But the fact is my you know, eyes and ears are always open uh, to kind of see or hear something that might be of interest to me. So I want to start off by sharing uh, a small story from about maybe six or seven years ago. I had moved uh, to Bangalore from Bombay and I got a call from a former editor of mine one evening and she had basically joined the New Indian Express, you know, to take over some of their feature pages and things like that. 
And she said, you know, why don't you, we'd like for you to come and write uh, a weekly column for us. So why don't you pitch some ideas to me? So I was, of course, very excited and flattered. And uh, I thought about it. And then I wrote back to her and said, you know, Lakshmi, I'd really like to write this weekly column about, you know, about everything and nothing. I want it to be about culture and about, you know, news and technology and society and what's trending, you know, on social media and that kind of thing. So that's what I want to write. And Lakshmi wrote back and said, no, you can't do that. You have to pick uh, an area. You have to pick kind of a, a niche topic that you can write about and you need to stick to that. And she was the one who said, look, you've written about parenting for me before. Why don't you write? Why don't you start a parenting column? And, um, you know, at the time I was a bit grumpy and I was like, oh, you know, I don't want to just write about parenting and be boxed in and known for only one thing. But I also really wanted to write this column. So, of course, I said yes. So that's how the mothership began. The mothership uh, was a weekly column that I wrote for five years. So for five years, every Tuesday, I would have to send in a column to my editor and it would come out on the Wednesday. And that really, I think that one experience alone taught me how to keep looking for ideas in, you know, in this one area or one theme of parenting. So I had to kind of keep coming up with an idea or a peg or some story on which I could write 550 words every Tuesday and keep things fresh and funny and not be repetitive, you know, and have that go out. Um, so I think this kind of experience of mine <laughs> taught me most of the things I know about, you know, creating content in a niche area. Um, and I think, you know, there was a lot of truth to what uh, Lakshmi, uh, my editor at the New Indian Express at that time had to say. There are definitely some pros to going niche, right? Um, I think your audience will start to, to kind of seek out uh, content in the area that you're interested in. And you can definitely build a far more engaged uh, audience who really, and who'll start looking forward to what you have to say about a particular topic or theme. And you can really kind of become known as, you know, I'm going to use these words a little loosely, expert, authority, a go-to person in this space. Um, for example, when I was writing The Mothership, I used to have so many people message me on social media and say, Wednesday, because the article would come out on Wednesdays, they would say, Wednesday, we go and drop our kids off at the bus stop for school. We come home, we make ourselves that second cup of chai or coffee, and then we sit down and read your column. So people really started to look forward to, to the column. And I was really able to build a very lovely uh, community of readers around the mothership. So I think those are definitely some of the pros to going niche. Uh, but, you know, there are always, there's always a downside. Um, and one of them we're going to try and address uh, in today's session. And that is to keep looking for ideas, you know, on a weekly basis to keep looking for ideas that you can turn into a column or, you know, a podcast or, you know, whatever it may be uh, in a, you know, in a fairly specific um, area. And some people, if you want to kind of then also evolve into other spaces and areas, but if you're known for kind of one niche topic, you might find yourselves feeling a little bit constrained by that. But for the purposes of today's session, we're going to look at that first thing, which is how can you keep creating, you know, ideas or how can you keep looking for ideas in your area of interest? Um, so I thought I'd use my own stack.me uh, to kind of show some of the ways in which I try to do this. Though I've spoken so much about parenting columns and being a writer about parenting and things like that. And even though my stack taught me is called mothership as well, I actually don't write about parenting on this space at all. I write pretty much only about children's books of all kinds, picture books, middle grade fiction, young adult, graphic novels, nonfiction, all of that. Um, because I just realized I wanted a place where I could put down you know, some of the things I was thinking about, my own writing, my own books, um, about other books that I was reading, things that were happening in the space of children's publishing. And I was getting a little annoyed with Instagram's algorithms also at that time. So this seemed like a really, really great place for me to just plant my flag, if you will. So there are a number of things I do on my stack.me. It's still a fairly, you know, new venture, and I'm still trying to find my own rhythm and cadence with, you know, putting posts out and writing on this space. 
But here are some of the things that, you know, I've been doing this past so many months on my page. So I think the first thing is it's always good to have a regular stream of programming for your stack.me. And for me, that is doing book reviews. So, you know, here are some of the book reviews um, that you can see uh, thumbnails from my stack.me. Uh, I'm also going to ask um, someone from the team to put up a review in the chat box of one of my posts on a picture book called In the Land Where Beetles Rule. So you can just kind of go through that if you feel like. But this is my kind of bread and butter content on my stack.me. I'm not a bookstagrammer. I'm not a book influencer or like a professional book reviewer or anything like that. So this is, though sometimes publishing houses do send me copies of books to read. But here it is pretty much, you know, books that I have read, loved, and just want to write about. So you'll find that, you know, a majority of the content on my stack.me are book reviews, you know, single book reviews um, that go up you know, every now and then. So I think it's always good to have a particular type of, you know, content that you put out. And you can even just start out doing that quite regularly in the beginning to kind of build that that kind of get into the flow of writing and give people an idea of, okay, this is what this space is about. This space is about children's book reviews or it's about architecture or whatever it might be, right? But have a particular kind of, you know, a type of content, they call it content buckets, have a particular kind of content that you can put out regularly. And I'd really recommend starting with maybe four or five posts that follow this format so that your community, your readers, get an idea um, of who you are, and the way you write, and kind of become familiar with you and your area of interest. So I have my regular programming bucket is, you know, standalone book reviews. But one thing I have started doing also is I repurpose content. So I'll tell you how I do that. Um, I very often interview authors, illustrators, editors uh, for columns or for articles that I'm writing. And these interviews tend to be, you know, over email or they're on Zoom. They're fairly intense. I ask, I'm that annoying person who asks lots and lots and lots of questions. And then, of course, ultimately, I have a word count to stick to. So not everything is able to make it to my, you know, to the final article that gets published. But I do have all this amazing kind of these amazing answers from other creators. And because there are they are about picture books, you know, I have now started taking those interviews and tweaking them, editing them a little bit, tidying them up and then publishing those on my stack.me. Of course, I get permission from, you know, from my guest, from the person who I've been interviewing before doing this. And then I send them the link so they can have a look at it. So this is a really nice, for me, this is really nice because I feel that I'm able to use all these wonderful answers and responses that they have shared with me, that they've taken the time to share with me. And, you know, I feel like, okay, I'm giving them a place on the internet to decide. And I think also for people who are interested in, you know, in children's books, whether it's parents, teachers, educators, other creators themselves, I think uh, there is a growing interest in being able to read about the thought process behind how some of their favorite authors are writing or the process that they're, you know, the illustrators whose work they really enjoy, the kind of artistic process they go through. So, um, for example, I interviewed Samya Rajendran, who's a really well-known children's book author for a piece in the Hindu. And she gave me such fantastic answers. The whole piece was about books that kind of talked about some really difficult topics for kind of teenagers and young adults, you know, around drugs, um, sexuality, gender, abuse, things like that. And she gave me such wonderful, uh, thoughtful answers. And I felt really happy that I was able to share that on my stack.me. And I've got, there's another example here, which is an interview I did with an author called Julie Murphy. She is an American young adult writer. And we did an email interview. And then I just used the rest of the responses over here. So do look for ways in which, you know, if you have that you can repurpose content that maybe you've put out somewhere else and find ways, you know, to see if you can put that on your stack.me. I know I've called this ride the hashtag, but I have some second thoughts and opinions now about this heading. But I think you all know that, you know, every month, every other day is some day or the other, um, you know, and there's usually a trending hashtag 
which if you also use social media to promote your stack.me, um, you know, why not? Why not kind of look for, you know, festivals, days of celebration, days of importance, themed weeks. And if there is an alignment with your area of interest, then I would really, really recommend looking for ways in which you can, um, you know, use these days, use these celebrations and festivities to kind of talk about the area that you're interested in. And here are three examples of how I've done that. Um, and I use this to do, uh, you know, these kind of celebratory days and events and things like that. I use them either to talk about my own work as a children's book author, or I use it to kind of share a list of books that parents or, you know, um, teachers might want to kind of add to their own classrooms, their own libraries, to be able to talk to their children about certain topics. So, for example, um, International Poetry Day, a lot of my early picture books for children were written in rhyme. So I used this day as, you know, an opportunity to kind of talk about some of those books, what those books were about, link to them, and also just about my own relationship with poetry growing up. Then, of course, uh, on Ambedkar Jayanti, I did a really small listicle about three children books uh, about Dr. Ambedkar that I really love and that I think are a fantastic addition to home and school libraries. And um, International Day of Girls and Women in Science. Um, two of my books happen to be STEM related, that's science, technology, engineering and math related and have you know very strong girl protagonists. So again, on this day, I chose to write about just how I wrote those books, the research that went into writing them, coming up with these characters, developing these characters, and again, being able to talk about, you know, my own work through this. Um, but a word of caution over here, uh, one is, I think, you know, like I said, you can have anywhere from like 10 to 30 days uh, or kind of, you know, celebrations or weeks or whatever it is right and there are like for example right now it's india postal week i think <clears throat> sorry so you really can end up don't end up just using every kind of day or event or week to kind of talk about your you know whatever you're interested in because i think one is your readers and your community will get tired of it fairly quickly i know i feel that way when i'm you know scrolling on instagram for example and everything, every kind of brand is just trying to, you know, or every kind of creator out there is just trying to kind of talk about this one thing ad nauseum. So I would say really, um, really pick the days and the events that you are actually interested in, that you really feel for, that you, that align also with, um, you know, your niche area of interest and really go for those. Um, I'll give you an example. It was World Mental Health Day on October 10th. And all through the day, I was like, oh, I should post something I should put up because there are so many fantastic books for children across age groups now that talk about mental health issues. So I thought I should do something. I should write something. I should post something. And then I even took some pictures of some picture books that I wanted to write about. But then, you know, at the end of the day, I thought, well, why am I really doing this? Is it because I just kind of want to also be part of all the other handles talking about World Mental Health Day, or do I do I really have something that I want to say now? And would it be better if I waited, gathered my thoughts a little bit, and then you know wrote about some of these books? So I actually didn't put that post out there. So go ahead and look for ways, uh, days, and events to align your area of interest to. But you know, be judicious in how much you kind of do this. Um. The next thing that I do is I collaborate, which is just a nice way of saying I work with my friends and I rope my friends into doing fun things with me. Um, so, for example, here are two examples from my stack.me. I have a really, really good friend who is also an author and editor. Her name is Yamini Vijayan. And we both just spend so much of our like regular conversations talking about children's books that we love and picture books and, you know, we thought last year, well, why not kind of take some of those conversations and do a little bit more with it? Now, this is also an example of repurposing content because this is actually something we first did and put up on our Instagram profiles. So the first example, um, the second example on the right-hand side was actually a series of book recommendations that we made together. So we both kind of, uh, you know, 
zero to three, three to five, you know, primary, middle school, that kind of thing, looked at age groups. And then we decided to make book recommendations of our most favorite books for each of these categories. And we did maybe like one every two to three weeks, we would put them up on Instagram. And, um, you know, after I spoke to Yamini about it, I decided it would be really nice if I could also put it up on my stack.me. So you'll find about six to seven, um, you know, recommendation lists like this on my stack.me. Um, and this did really well on Instagram. We got a lot of messages from our followers telling us that they went and ordered like all the books on the lists and things like that. So that felt really great. And for example, it also gave me an idea of possibly like if I ever, you know, began to monetize my content on stack.me, I might start doing it off with, you know, really specialized curated um, book recommendation lists. So that's one thing we've done. And the other thing is actually just uh, like our conversations, we uh, open up a Google Doc every month and we pick a book and we both kind of do a back and forth of what we love about these books and maybe what we don't love so much about them as well, because I think for both of us, it's important that we're really honest when we're writing. So um, some of these conversations have started going up as well, kind of like a picture book chat. So really, if you have friends who are as excited about your area of interest, who are also kind of keen on the subjects that you are keen on, really consider collaborating with them. One is I think it brings in a lot of new ideas, especially if you're feeling a little bit stuck with kind of coming up with new ideas, working with a friend or working with a partner is a great way to kind of, you know, get out of that rut. So really look at collaborating with friends. Uh, lots of new ideas can come in. You might even want to ask someone to kind of come and be a guest blogger on your stack.me and have them come in once a month, once in two months, whatever that frequency works out. And, um, and also kind of put in their point of view. And I think earlier we also said, you know, that kind of difficulty of branching off into other topics. If you have a friend who is interested like in an adjacent area, right, and who's an expert in that particular area or field, you can even have them come in and just kind of write or, you know, provide audio or do a video on something completely, you know, uh, that's a little bit out of your own wheelhouse. And just talking about formats here, uh, of course, Yamni and I tend to both you know, prefer to write and put up pictures and things like that. But if you and your friend, for example, are comfortable on camera and because stack.me allows you to upload audio, video and things like that, I really recommend even, you know, just kind of recording an audio conversation between the two of you or, you know, uh, filming a conversation between the two of you and putting that up. So that way you're also kind of mixing it up in terms of, of the kind of content, you know, not just, you know, text and images, maybe audio, video, that kind of thing. So really look for friends um, who you like, get along with, um, maybe have like friendly disagreements with, that's also fine. But I think collaborating with people is a really, really great way to, again, just look for new and fresh ideas. Um, the next thing that you can do and which I do is to combine interests. I love listening to podcasts. I work with a podcast production company. So, um, you know, I have written and because I'm a writer as well, I write books. Um, you know, I've done a post on writing podcasts that I love. Um, and I kind of thought back to my favorite five podcasts, which feature writers or, you know, people interviewing writers or writers just talking about their work and their creative process. And then, you know, I picked which episodes, um, you know, from these shows that I love the best and I linked to them. So I did like a small, you know, listicle of writing podcasts that I love. And, you know, again, as a parent, uh, I can never take off my parenting hat, unfortunately. Um, and as a writer, again, of children's books, you know, there's this, I, I wrote this piece called And the Moral of the Story Is... And that was really just about my own irritation of this need for all children's books to have this like good moral for children at the end of it. So again, if you have, uh, and it, this is a nice way if you're looking to kind of branch out into other adjacent areas, other topics, and if you can find a way to combine, you know, your main interest with something else and that, you know, that feels organic and that works and there's a nice flow to it, definitely look at combining interests. 
um, I think the last thing is to try new things. And this is a new thing which I've been trying recently. And those are book pairings. So um, again, it's not really a review review, but it's more of if I'm like reading a bunch of things and I find that there's some connection between two books that I have read uh, or more, then I'll kind of try and pair them together. And it's not always children's books. You can see in the first post, I took Silence, which is a book by, you know, a Buddhist monk, a Vietnamese monk, uh, Thich Tat Han. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. So that's a book very much for adults. It's about being present in the mon uh, present in the moment and silence and things like that. And then I combined it with a picture book written way back in the late 60s, um, you know, by Leo Leone, which is about a small field mouse. And I know these two things seem completely disconnected. Uh, and I guess that's where the charm is. But I found a lot of links between them. So I've started doing these book pairings. I did another one, which was a picture book biography of an artist. And then I paired them with two books that he's actually written uh, and he's illustrated for children. So I'm really looking forward to doing more of these book pairings. It's something fun and interesting for me because it just keeps me thinking about the kind of books I can pair. And I'm hoping that it's something nice for my community as well. So it's not just the kind of straightforward reviews that I might write otherwise. Um, so those were all the things that I do on my stack.me. Just a couple of practical tips, I think, <coughs> before I wind up. Um, so one thing I, I've done for whether it's the podcasts that, you know, I work to promote um, or, you know, the organizations that I'm working with or for my columns that I write or even as a children's book author, set up uh, a Google News Alert for your area of interest. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I found that a lot of like, especially with my parenting column, a lot of my ideas have come up from Google News Alerts. So I've got alerts for parenting, parents, children, you know, those kind of things. And, um, you know, I've written about the spelling bee in America after, you know, yet another Indian uh, child or Indian origin child won it. <coughs> I've written about for Mothership about this like huge fight between two Instagram mom influencers because they both wanted to name their child the same thing and they both wanted to name their babies baby so I thought that was hilarious so I'm always finding these really weird and strange um you know news articles which um can really kind of spark an idea for a post or for a podcast episode or whatever it is, whatever it is that you're interested in creating um at the start of the month I'm usually kind of I will type in a search for important days or festivals this month again like I said use this judiciously or don't do it at all it's fine um, and, you know, for all my roles, I do set up a content calendar. I think it really helps um, deciding how many posts a month or a week, if you're very prolific, you want to create. And it gives you an idea of the kind of mix of, you know, posts that you might want to put out there. Um, so you kind of can see uh, what you have. You might also be able to identify, okay, there's more of this kind. I'm just doing book reviews this month. I'm going to mix it up and put something else out there. Or, you know, actually, this is a, a lean month and I don't have that many ideas, but I think having some idea <coughs> of a content calendar also um, helps. Again, uh, I don't know if this is a no brainer or not, but please do follow other people in your area of interest on social media, on Twitter and Instagram. Um, so the, the post that I was talking about and the moral of the story is that idea actually came to me because I, uh, there's an illustrator and writer I follow on Instagram called Vinaya Kavarma, and he had actually retweeted a tweet from Ezra Klein about a John Klassen book. And that's, you know, the cover, the image that you see in that thumbnail um, about how books don't need to have a moral. So that really kind of got me thinking about how I felt on that topic. And then I wrote about it. Um, I did embed you know, Vinayak's tweet in my post and kind of tagged him and did all of that. So if you are seeing a post on social media that sparks an idea, I think it's always good practice to embed that post, you know, tag that person, um, especially when you're promoting it. It's just a good practice to follow. So, but I get a lot of ideas from the things that I see other people tweeting or writing about. I think pace yourself. Um, it can feel like everyone else out there is kind of, churning out posts uh, by the dozen uh, and it can kind of put the pressure on you know us sometimes to feel like we need to do that as well 
I'm still finding my own cadence and rhythm on how often I want to post on my stack.me. It's currently in this like when I really feel like it and, you know, uh, then I put it up, uh, put something up. But that's not a great practice either because I think I can go sometimes for a whole month without putting anything up at all. So I think try and find, you know, a cadence and a rhythm that works for you, that doesn't kind of feel exhausting, that doesn't feel, you know, like a chore and, you know, find something that really works for you and try to kind of ignore what other people, how much other people are posting as well. I think my last point is just to have fun uh, and to really enjoy yourself. I always believe that if we have fun when we're creating uh, these ideas and these posts, I think the readers have fun when they're consuming them. And that is the end of my session. <laughs> Excellent. Um, thank you so much, Menika. That was uh, really fantastic. Um, <laughs> so I do have a couple of questions. Uh, just to start off with a much simpler one that, you know, because you've published so many books, um, you know, from different kind of publishing houses, the first question that comes into my head is regarding children's books. Has there been any form of writing that kind of has been inspired from your childhood? And if so, how did you go about the process? Oh. So that would be my first question. I think um, I think I've definitely tapped into some of, you know, and I think there's always this question that, you know, writers, children's book authors get asked, do you need to have children to write books for children? And I think the answer right. is always no. I don't think you need to have kids to write books for kids. But I think you need to remember what it was like to be a child. And I think that's one thing that um, I'm always trying to kind of do is to tap into that emotion and that feeling of what it was, what it was like to be a child going to school, how unfair the world seems, you know, and how it feels when your friendships don't work out or your crushes don't work out or whatever it is. I think, you know, I'm always trying to tap into that. <laughs> and of course, sometimes I do kind of look back to people I've known and, you know, in school and college and teachers and things like that. And you'll find little bits of them make their way into characters as well. And uh, I'll have friends of mine who've gone with me to school message me and say, I know that this is that teacher we had in seventh standard, that kind of thing. So I, I definitely do that. Um, also, because I have two kids at home, I have an 11 year old and a 14 year old. There for me, this kind of a, a little window into what it's like to be a child today. Because I think while the emotions are very often the same and the feelings are the same, the experiences of how they're kind of just out there in the world. First critics in the house who will read what I write and say, you know, this is, you, know you need to work on that or this is good. So, but I think, yeah, I think I'm very often kind of looking back into childhood experiences and moments and people I've known and little bits of that will make its way into my writing. Absolutely. I agree. And why and from where this question has come, because, you know, I had recently watched an interview, a very old interview of J.K. Rowling, uh, where, you know, she had spoken about how there were so many characters in Harry Potter, like Horace Laghorn or Dumbledore. The characteristics of the character was inspired by somebody she knew, like yeah. way back. So, you know, it, this is a question that's something that, you know, really intrigues me about any writer whatsoever as to how do characters kind of inspire them and where do they garner the inspiration from. So that's yeah. Uh, yeah. where this question was. Always say, right, if you're friends or if you're fam related to a writer, just assume yeah. that anything you say or do is going to make its way into a book at some point of time. I think that's Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, uh, the next question that I have is, you know, regarding this wonderful piece that you had written and the moral of the story is, um, uh, which was something that we have always been kind of intrigued by, you know, growing up, at least when I was growing up, we've always had books, uh, I've read books that had a lesson towards the end or a moral of the story, so-called. And um, the, the article that you wrote about, so my question here is a little technical in the sense that, when you write about these points, because you're focusing on a niche audience and here your audience is kind of children, um, do you experience any kind of backlash? If so, how do you deal with it? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I haven't, I, I will say I am touch wood so far, uh, fairly lucky in that no one has kind of reached out to me so far and said that, well, I don't, I don't agree with you and things like that. Um, 
but i think that it's i mean it's okay i've you know i've had kind of people maybe not like some of my books so much and things like that and you know and i think it's all right i think you have to take some i think i look for what the criticism is for example and you know just if i can digress i do a lot of sessions with children in schools where i go and read to them and there's a q and a at the end of that and the first question kids always ask me is how do you deal with bad like with negative feedback and criticism and i'm always really surprised i'm like your kids why do you care about bad feedback but um i think i always tell them that i see what the feedback is and if someone is telling me why they have that feedback so like my younger son will read something i've written and he'll say what well, i don't like this that's like then he's really telling me why right he's like this doesn't sound this doesn't ring true it doesn't sound right because you know me and my friends don't talk this way you're trying too hard to be cool or whatever it is right so i think that's like good feedback that i can take if someone's like well your book is rubbish or your post is rubbish then i'll be like okay fine <laughs> you know that's that is what it is that's your opinion i don't think i try and spend too much time uh, rebutting or offering any explanations for those things i don't know if i answered the question but <laughs> i think that's the best way of looking at it absolutely um my uh, final but um i would request you to elaborate on this is because you know we have a lot of writers who just started out their journey and we definitely have also a couple of creators who are focusing on podcasts and they are probably writers right now and because you've spoken about writing podcasts and you have uh, you know ha- kind of written about a collection of writing podcasts that you have for instance yeah. uh, so if you could guide uh, you know the creators at stack.me who are just starting out as to you know what is the process to go about and um, how to get rid of those uh, so called inhibitions and uh, you know so called fear that they have you know because we all have that i'm not talking about writers block specifically but you know when starting out just thinking what if nobody reads my piece uh, what yeah. happens next so if you could throw a little more light on that and just so oh, um well, i want to say one thing i think that little fear that i think even after you've published a few books at least for me i still always um wonder even if it's an article going out in the newspaper or if it's a book i'm publishing i do think there's always some fear like is this good enough you know are people yeah. going to um you know engage with this are they going to enjoy reading it or is it going to kind of bring up some emotion in them mm-hmm. so here are some of the things that i do for myself um i think once i've written whether it's a it's an article or it's a manuscript for a picture book or a book or whatever it is right uh, i think once i've written it and i've done editing and i've let it sit for a while <coughs> i have uh, i'm very lucky a also because i get to work with editors who i respect tremendously and who are able to guide me in my writing but even before i send it to my editors i have a group of people who i really who's you know opinion i really respect whose judgment i respect and you know based on their time and availability i'll send it to them and i'll say hey can you read this and tell me what you think and the idea between us is that to be really honest right what's working what's not working of course i have lovely friends when things are not working they tell me that in the most kindest and wonderful ways never make me feel bad but um they really will kind of take that time to read my work and to come back with very constructive kind of so that helps in a way i feel like and honestly if you're just starting out that doesn't it doesn't have to be another writer or a editor or anything like that right it can be a really good friend of yours whose opinion who you know is going to tell you the truth and i think it's also important that you're able to take that feedback if you want it right but i think it helps to have you know some of of what they think and you don't have to take everything on board but i think that sometimes you've always all, already done it once with a small kind of trusted group of people that you know and maybe that helps then in 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 putting things out there and and kind of letting the rest of the world read it um but having said that there are so many now writing groups uh, kind of writing accountability groups um and things like that that you can find online and i think if you can find one or even make one for yourself mm-hmm. you know of people that i think those are good places to kind of just kind of share work test work out before you put it out there but again i have to say i mean in spite of all of this i still think i write the books that 
I most want to read or I wanted to read as a child. I write the kind of articles that I really feel that, you know, I want to see more of. And, you know, I think also trying to kind of fit in what you're doing into a larger kind of what you think the world wants is also a bit problematic sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, excellent. Um, I think most of our questions and doubts are kind of answered. So uh, with this, uh, thank you so much. Menika, for your time. Um, I'm sure you've inspired a lot of people to get their journey, uh, you know, on writing in general, not necessarily only about children's books, specifically, of course, but creating for that niche audience or that niche community. Um, and for those uh, who are not sure uh, which platform to use appropriately for your work, stack.me is the place for you. I would also like to plug in the information there that we have recently introduced something called Picto. So Picto is is um, uh, the place where you can generate your own images by using by the help of AI and uh, do try it out at stack.me slash picto um, do try out any particular name that you can enter any particular topic that you're writing on uh, you can get feature images profile photos book covers for instance um, uh, go ahead and try this out and um, thank you everybody for joining um, see you guys in the next coming weeks with a different topic and a different creator so Till then, have a great week. Thank you, Menaka, once again. Uh, Thanks. Bye. bye.